Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. It is 1 p.m. out here on the West Coast, which means it's time for our STEM lesson being presented at the Edwards Air Force Base Air Show in the year 2020. So I have some PowerPoint slides. I will try to share them, see if this works. And I think that that worked. Uh, okay, I hope that everybody can hear me and see me. My name is Erin Varhus. I will be your host for this lesson, which is titled A Day in the Life of a Design Engineer. So, welcome. You might be wondering, what is a design engineer anyways? Well, a design engineer researches, studies, and develops ideas for new, new designs. And I thought, you know, a good way to learn that would be to just practice what they do. Hence, a day in the life of a design engineer which means for the next 30 minutes, you are a design engineer. We're gonna learn about the design process. So I'm gonna need you to put your thinking caps on and gather these materials. We need one eight and a half by 11 piece of construction paper or regular paper works too. A pen, a pencil, anything that writes, tape, scissors, ruler. So as you look for that, I'm gonna display it here at the bottom of the screen and give you a little introduction to me so you know who I am on the other end of the telephone computer here. So as I mentioned, my name is Aaron Varhus. I have been working for Boeing for nearly 10 years. I'm in my fifth job. I'm currently a test and evaluation engineer out here at Edwards Air Force Base working on the B-1 flight test team. I have some really cool hobbies. I love to go backpacking. I love to go hiking. I also like drinking coffee and visiting countries overseas, even though that's not happening a lot this year. By way of formal education, I have a Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering from Colorado State University, go Rams. I also have a Master of Science in Systems Architecting and Engineering from USC, the University of Southern California. The picture here is what I like to call my inspiration. It's a picture of my two grandpas. My dad's dad was a B-52 hydraulics technician, which is really neat because we have those planes out here at Edwards Air Force Base. My mom's dad was an Air Force pilot and he's flown all sorts of things from, I mean, any airplane, you name it, he's flown it. And then there's little old me in the middle. It is hard to believe that I used to be that tiny, but I guess, Time flies when you're having a great time, and it really has been an awesome time for the last 10 years. I thought I would include a photograph of the aircraft that I currently support. This is the B-1, and as I mentioned, they're out here at the Edwards Air Force Base. And this jet is really cool. Okay, so let's get started. Remember, you're a design engineer, and you're sitting at your desk, minding your own business, and you get a new assignment from the boss. He calls you up and he says, hey, you're a design engineer. I want you to design me something new. Uh, it must fly. Don't make it too expensive. I want it to fit in a shoebox. And oh, by the way, get it done in the next 30 minutes. Whoa, we got a lot of work to do. So what do you do first? Well, the first step is to brainstorm some ideas. So you sit there and you think, what do I know that flies? I know some airplanes, some rockets, hot air balloons, different toys. I know some things in nature that fly. I, I got a few ideas here. Yeah. So you just think all the stuff up and you put it out on the table and then you move on to the next step, which is to pick a design or at least a design concept to start. So the way you do this is you think, hmm, what did my boss say? And you turn what he says into design requirements. So he mentioned that it must fly. We will say that it needs to be made out of things around the house because he said he wanted it to be inexpensive. It needs to be smaller than these dimensions so it can fit in that shoebox that he mentioned. And we must be able to complete fabrication in less than 10 minutes because I only got 30 minutes right now and I have to sit through these slides first and learn all these cool things. So 10 minutes seems just about right. 
So you think back to the previous slide and you go, hmm, what on there fits these things? What could I start with? Ah, this loop airplane. I think I could build that. Looks like it's the right size. We'll start with that at least for now. So you go on to the next step, which is to communicate the design. A lot of engineers these days use computers and different programs that make 3D images of what it is that you want to build. So you can model these things, put them all together. You can see how they fit together. You can decide dimensions and it's pretty cool. The next step is to communicate the design again, but this time by way of 2D design drawing. So right here, we have three parts that you just saw on the previous slide. You're showing different views here, some different dimensions. And then here you're showing the assembly again. And I will move my face over here so you can see it. Um, so yeah, this is the 2D assembly. And then you make a parts list. So the parts list is a place for a lot of information to go. It's a table. Um, it has the part number, so you give each of these parts a number so that you can stay organized. Um, by way of tradition, a lot of assemblies have part numbers that end with one. So your airplane assembly is 001, and that's the entire pl plane. And then you have your small wing loop and your large wing loop, which you are calling an assembly, because as you'll notice, they also have brackets on them. So in essence, you have a couple of parts put together, so you call them an assembly. And then you have your bracket there listed separately and your fuselage, and you give them part description names, and you pick a material. You go, well, I got some paper around, straw, tape. You decide the quantities, and you put the dimensions sometimes, too. So then you take this, you go to the next step, which is to work with all your teammates. At your company, you call everybody up and you ask them, is my design acceptable? You send them a little picture and you use your team working skills to see what these other disciplines may say about your design that maybe you didn't think about. So you call it materials, stress, propulsion, flight controls, loads, procurement, aerodynamics, and there's several more. And you talk with them and you discuss if your design is good. Next step is to improve and revise the design. So you consider all the feedback you receive from your friends and you make changes as necessary. So for example, let's say the procurement agent says, hey, straws are no, not available. No can do, no straws in your design. I can't find them, I can't buy them, no straws. So you go, okay, mm, I could replace that straw with something uh, rolled up paper, that should work. Yeah, that'll be about the same. And then you remember that the arrow team said, hey, the large loop needs to go in the back and the small loop needs to go in the front because I like your design, but I ran it through my little program and it's kind of unstable. And I know by experience that if you swap those loops, your design will be a lot better. And you go, wow, thank you. Okay, cool. So you go back to your design and you make a few changes. So the first change you make is you change the material of the fuselage to paper. It used to be straw, now it's paper. And because you did that, you have to change a few other things. So you change your part number to be 041 because now it's technically fuselage assembly instead of just fuselage. You change the quantity of your brackets to eight because your new fuselage is going to require a few brackets to keep it together. So that's the first thing. And then the next thing, as you can see, you swapped the big loop. Oh, let me move my face. You swap the big loop and the small loop to make your design more stable based on your arrow friends' advice. So there you go, that's your final design. So a lot of design engineers aren't necessarily 
involved in the build process, but today we get to be. So I want you to use your design drawing as well as these steps that I've laid out here to make your airplane. All right, so I'm gonna move this camera over here. Hopefully you can see me. Hello, hello. Okay, so I got my materials here. I have my piece of paper that you guys already gathered. I have some scissors. I've got a ruler. I have some tape and I also have a pen. Okay, so let's do step one. Step one says cut one strip of paper with dimension 11 inches by two inches. Now we know this paper is 11 inches this way. So we just need to measure two inches on the side here. So you can make a mark or two and then draw a line where you're going to cut the paper. Got my line here, so I'm going to cut. Okay, so when you're done with that, you will have one piece of 11 inches by two inches. We'll put that aside. The next part of the step says cut three strips of paper with dimensions five inch by one inch. So I'm gonna need you to mark a one inch and a one inch and draw the line again. So my line and cut. Okay, now I have my one inch strip of paper here. So I'm gonna put it here, measure five inches. Add five inches here and then here and then cut. Okay, so it looks like we got two of the five inch pieces out of that. So we need to cut another strip of one inch. So we take our paper again, bring it over here and measure one inch, one inch. Let me draw a line. Our other line. And take the scissors and cut it. So we have another one inch piece of paper and you will measure five inches. And cut. Okay, so we now have one two inch by 11 inch pieces, piece, excuse me, of paper. We also have three five inch by one inch pieces of paper. And I don't see any other cutting tasks in the rest of the list. So we're gonna put the rest of the paper to the side. We're also going to put our scissors aside and the ruler aside and also the pen. 
This is called keeping a clean workspace, which is good to prevent FOD for an object degree. You will learn a lot about that in your aerospace career. Okay, oh, this is extra two, so I'll put it over here. Okay, so now we're going on to step two, which says take two one inch strips of paper and tape them together end to end. So we'll do like this. Take a piece of tape, also called a bracket in your design. Okay, we got this. Now it says make a loop and tape the loop closed. So we made a loop here. Whoops, let's go the other way. There, that's better. And take another piece of tape and tape the loop closed. Okay, so now we are done with step two. Set this aside. You're doing great. Okay, step three. Take the last one inch strip of paper and make a loop and tape the loop closed. So we make a loop, we grab the tape, and here we go. We're now done with step three. Nice work, everybody. Okay, now for step four. This is a little more challenging, so if you need help at home, I understand because I hope that I can make this part. All right, so step four, roll up two inches strip of paper to make a straw fuselage. Okay, so I'm gonna roll it up starting here where my fingers are. And I'm gonna try to make the roll really small so that it can end up looking kind of like a straw. You guys are probably better at this than I am. You should call me up after and tell me about your manufacturing techniques. Okay, so I'll give you a little bit more time to get this, but I'm gonna go ahead and do the second part of step four to secure it. So when you're done rolling it, you can take a piece of tape, put one in the middle, and then put one at the end, and then put one at the other end. All right, so I'll give you a minute to fix, finish that. And we can put our, well, actually no, we need to keep the tape for the next step. <laughs> I have my puppy dog here. She likes to build planes too. Okay, so now step number five, put both loops on the fuselage and secure with one piece of tape each. So we got one loop, put it over here, take a piece of tape and secure this to this loop. Like this. And then we take the other loop on the other side, put another piece of tape. Okay, now we can put the tape aside.
Okay, so this is what you should have. All right, let's see what the next step is. Time to fly. Let's see if this thing can fly. Avery, come in. Watch out, plane's flying. Let's see. Uh-oh, it hit the wall. <laughs> Woo. Well, it does fly. Let's try it again. This is what we call test flight. Okay, I hope everybody has worked. Put this back here. All right. So, how does everybody's plane fly? Are there any more design improvements you can think of? Um, so sometimes what happens is there are a lot of improvements or hopefully not too many improvements, but there are some improvements that can be made after you find out how your product actually performs. Um, so what other changes would you make to make it better? I think for myself, I would put some more brackets, some more tape around the fuselage so that the paper can stay together better. Um, I think that I would also add some color to it because my airplane is just all one color. What would you do? How would you make your airplane better? Okay, so the boss calls you again and he says, great job and thank you. So this is the end of the class. I hope that you guys learned something. I hope it was fun. Um, I think you can get a hold of me via email if you have any questions. Um, but other than that, I hope you have a great day and hope you have fun watching the rest of the air show and learning more things. All right, bye. Okay, Candace, it's all yours. Okay. Can everybody see my screen? All right. Oh, here we go. Well, good afternoon. I'd like to thank everyone for tuning in to what might seem like a bit of an oddball presentation for an air show. If you're here, I'm assuming that you're interested in some of the lesser known areas of STEM that the Air Force delves into. Or maybe my title caught your eye and you wondered, why are there archeologists working at an air base? Which I'd love to answer that question for you today and show you some of the ways that scientists partners like myself and my fellow archeologists are helping contribute to the Air Force mission. If I can give you just a very brief introduction and overview of what I'll cover in this presentation. My name is Candace Vogel and I am the Director of Curation here at Edwards. This means that I'm part of an archeologist team and my job is to keep safe, repair and research the artifacts that we recover on and around base. Um, some of you may be surprised to learn that the Great Basin in Antelope Valley is one of the most robust archaeological research locations in North America. We have uh, almost every segment of California occupation, uh, including mission period exploration, 
uh, gold panning and gold mining, settlers, homesteaders, and everything as far back to some of the earliest Native Americans. Today, I'd like to give you an example of how we conduct our research using some of the same physical principles that engineers use while studying propulsion and flight. Many of the webinars this week have covered the laws of motion brilliantly. So if you've been tuning in since Monday, this will be just a brief overview of Newton's three laws. But more importantly, I wanna show you how my team and I are able to identify ancient artifacts based on the understanding of force and kinetic energy transference. Now, Newton may have been the first to truly explain the laws of motion in the scientific sense, but humans have used physics to accomplish tasks for over a million years. Now, that's not to say that Neanderthals knew the equation F equals MA, but rather our ancestors used the understanding of these concepts to craft tools. In fact, the oldest known tools are hammer stones that we found in Southern Africa at the Old Divide Gorge. They're between 2.4 and 1.7 million years old. And these were made by our pre-human ancestor Homo habilis. To put that into perspective, Homo sapiens, we estimate have only existed for 300,000 years or less. Now, that chunky looking pattern that you see on the chopper stone in my picture were formed through calculated strikes that unknowing to the person who created it factored in Newton's second and third laws. One of the most common questions I actually get is, how do archaeologists know the difference between a rock that was a tool and just a plain old rock? And the answer has everything to do with physics, which I'm about to explain. You actually, you might also be thinking, why should I care about old rocks? And the truth is, if you don't think ancient tool making is cool in the next 20 minutes, it's not going to hurt my feelings. But what is important is learning that the same laws of motion that explain the transfer of energy from your foot to a soccer ball or helps a shuttle escape the Earth's atmosphere are a science that we've understood and used to our benefit for all of human history. One might even say that the realization of physics is what helped us make tools in the first place and ultimately what propelled us to become human. So what our ancient ancestors didn't know, of course, is that their understanding of how rocks break in certain directions is actually a demonstration of what Isaac Newton would later describe as the laws of motion. Just to make sure that we all have a basic knowledge of Newton's laws, I want to provide just a brief overview and give you some modern examples first. Even if you did not know, these were the actual Newtonian laws. Many of you have likely heard one or more of these quoted conversationally. For example, law one states, everybody remains in a state of rest or uniform motion unless acted upon by a net external force. Law two states that the amount of acceleration of a body is proportional to the acting force and inversely proportional to the mass of the body. And law three states that every action has an equal opposite reaction. Uh, so that's a bit of a mouthful, but I'm gonna break it down a little bit more, so don't worry. Newton's first law states that if a body is at rest or moving at a constant speed in a straight line, it will remain at rest or keep moving in a straight line at a constant speed, unless it's acted upon by an external force. This postulate is known as the law of inertia. The law of inertia was first formulated by Galileo for her horizontal motion on earth and was later generalized by Rene Descartes. Before Galileo it had been thought that all horizontal motion required a direct cause, but Galileo deduced from his experiments that a body in motion would remain in motion unless a force like friction caused it to come to rest. A great example of this would be like when a basketball player shoots a jump shot, the ball follows the normal arc path. 
if you throw it in a jump shot, it's always going to make that same arc pattern. Now, the ball follows the path because its motion obeys the law of inertia, i.e., the reason the ball will eventually fall down instead of traveling through the air for all eternity is because it's being acted upon. The air it passes through creates friction that slows the ball and gravity is acting on the ball, pulling it down towards the ground. Newton's second law is actually easier to explain in the quantitative. This law states that the time rate of change of the momentum of a body is equal in both magnitude and direction to the force imposed on it. The momentum of a body is equal to the product of its mass and its velocity. Momentum, like velocity, is a vector quantity having both magnitude and direction. A force, and this is most important for what we'll talk about in regards to making stone tools, when applied to a body can change the magnitude of the momentum or its direction or both. When you put this into the equation F equals MA, force equals mass times acceleration, you can understand that the number that quantifies mass or acceleration, for example, will affect what we understand as the quantity of force because F equals MA, so F must always equal M times A. Newton's third law states that when two bodies interact, they apply forces to one another that are equal in magnitude and opposite in direction. The third law is the law of action and reaction. This law in our case can be applied to bodies in accelerated motion. This, the force that this law describes is a real one. For example, if you were to sit on a skateboard and throw a bowling ball, you would roll backwards, right? According to the law of action and reaction, this happens because when you apply force to the ball, the ball also applies force to you, like pushing you back like a coiled spring. Okay, so we have a generalized idea of what these three laws of motion mean, but what does this have to do with arrowheads? In other words, the real reason we're here is to nerd out about archaeology, right? So why does physics apply to old rocks? Why do, what do these laws have to do with stone tools like arrowheads? And why does an archaeologist need to understand this at all? First, Know that the Great Basin where Edwards Air Force Base is located is one of the oldest human occupation sites on the continent. Archaeologists have discovered stone tools from at least 14,000 years old. That's more than twice as old as the pyramids. Because we have this dry desert environment, a good amount of artifacts preserve and allow us to study the lives and culture of some of the earliest known Native Americans. My team and I that work here use our understanding of inertia, mass, and reactionary laws to predict how many different types of stone will break when struck by humans versus when they break from tumbling down a hill, for example. We can even tell if fragments of rock are cast-offs from making a tool, even if they're not a tool or ever used themselves. We can detect if these rocks were struck by a person by observing patterns on the rock at where it was struck. Remember force equals mass times acceleration? A force, when applied to a body, can change the magnitude of the momentum or its direction or both. So look at the image on the far left of your screen. This is a rock that was used to break off pieces for making tools like arrowheads or scrapers to process meat or cutters to cut meat off bone. We call this type of rock a core. Normally, uh, I'd pass one of these around to you and you'd get to see and hold a lot of really cool artifacts. We are digital, so let's you know try to do this off images and maybe you can come visit someday. All right, we can tell that these are intentionally, are, are intentionally broken based on the uniformity. If you look really close to that core, you'll see a concaved striped looking pattern. A rock tumble will not create multiple vertical rock shatters. Not only that, but 
we know they were created by people by being struck by a net external force. In other words, someone took another rock and struck this core repeatedly in order to break pieces off in a specific direction. Now, the middle picture is an artifact that we call a flake, meaning we can tell by looking at it that it's we can tell by looking at it that it is human made intentionally broken rock but not used or shaped yet into a tool so if you look really close you can see horizontal ripples extending across its surface it almost looks like uh, ripples in a pond because every action has an equal opposite reaction when a core is struck the resulting flake that breaks off has an external force that was applied to it, which traveled along the paths of least resistance in the rock, which exploiting and subsequently broke at the fractures within that rock. This all happened in milliseconds. The energy traveled through the rock in a whip-like fashion and altered the surface of the rock on a molecular level, creating in that center picture you see there, that bulbous shape and the ripple patterns that are permanently altered on the surface and is a result of the force applied when striking the rock. And this can only be caused by a directed strike held off the ground in a human hand. And that is how we can tell the difference between a rock and an artifact. Now, what I'd like to do is go through some of the artifacts that we have here in our collection at the curation facility on base. This is a point made of chert. It's definitely old, but we have uh, ones, for example, that are uh, fluted in this manner, and we would call this a cottonwood point. One of the ones that I really wanted to show you here is actually not a tool, but it's a flake made of rhyolite. This is a really great example of what I was talking about, being able to see where the surface of the rock was actually altered by being struck. Because you can see the jarring angular pattern on this flake, you can tell that it was struck by a force. Whether or not it's human then depends on whether or not we can see something called a point of impact, meaning the specific position where the rock was struck. And if we can see those uh, bulbous uh, Hertzian cone of force like uh, alterations on the rock that show us that it was off the ground when force traveled through it and broke it from its original core. Different types of material have different reactions when being struck and shaped into a tool as well. The last one was rhyolite. This is a material that we call chert. And the really great thing about this specific point is that you can really see the sections where it hands. Braided edge, for example, this is something that A rock being struck by another rock random creates something like a pressure flake, but it won't do it in a uniform pattern in this manner. This specific, these two specific projectile points that I'm showing you here as well are definitely on the older side and we're able to date them based on their pattern and design. The longer the fluted point is, the older it is. These, like the Clovis point that I told you about earlier, could be as old as 10,000 years and were found here in the Antelope Valley. I wanted to show you an image of this particular point as well. This one was made out of quartz. The image on the left shows especially uh, something called flake scarring where specific small pieces of flake were knocked off to create that overall fluted point shape. This one is a little bit smaller than the last image that I showed you. So typically we tend to date that 
uh, to a little more modern, perhaps uh, eight to 7,000 years old. We know that as technology progressed and points became smaller and more refined, therefore any type of point that you find that is very, very large tends to be on the older side. And of course we have a lot of other ways of dating materials. Uh, the stratigraphy of the soil that we found it in, uh, carbon dating. We can even do some things with macro botanical studies based on what, what materials we find very, very small in the serrated edges embedded in the point. This is a very special point. It's red jasper and it's called a Lake Mojave point. Um, it's endemic to our region, very, very specifically here, dating to approximately 7,000 years ago. One of the things that you might notice, as opposed to the long, fluted, almost spear-like points that I showed you earlier, this one is starting to have a little bit of a neck and is starting to define itself in that more sort of prototypical arrowhead-looking uh, shape. This is an obsidian flake. Now, examples that I showed you earlier of a core and a flake and a point were also obsidian. There's something very special about the material itself. And that is that there is no obsidian sources in the Southern part of California. The closest obsidian source is actually nearer to Sacramento which means we get very excited when we find obsidian materials out here in Antelope Valley because it's not just a point, it's evidence for trade. The only way to get obsidian here and to have points that are dating to thousands of years ago is that that material was brought in all the way from Sacramento, either through Native Americans who came and went and brought materials from that region or through trade with other tribes. We know, for example, that the Katanamic who lived here near Air Edwards Air Force Base traded with the Chumash because not only did we find obsidian and points that are similar in shape, we also found shell beads that could be located back to the Channel Islands. Now I'm showing you points today because they give us the best example of the Newtonian laws of motion, which is the big you know, takeaway that we have here. But I also want to point out that we have a huge number in our collection here at Edwards of groundstone tools. This is something called a mono. And the reason we're able to tell the difference between a mono and another rock, for example, is that you can see there the very, very flat, slicked edge. That uniform slicked edge can only be created when force is applied to the other side of the rock and the rock is pressed down and ground against another hard surface. Only humans can do this. So I want to go ahead and uh, Take a few questions if anybody is interested in asking questions. And I want to thank you for tuning in to uh, what my presentation as, as uh, archaeology is not necessarily something you'd expect at an air show, but it is something that we do here on the air base. Um, not only that, but I'd like to remind everybody that the curation office here on base is open to the public. and maybe in times when we're able to, I would love to take visitors in the future if you're interested in learning more about archaeology and about the history of Antelope Valley. Thank you. Hi, Candice. Hi. What's the most surprising thing you learned about in studying airheads? In studying arrowheads? Or in the history of the Antelope Valley? The trade is what fascinates me the most, The that we can be out in the middle of the desert and find shells from the coast. Uh, you're, you're talking about uh, 
you know, 70, 80, sometimes more miles inland that shells were carried in and then traded for other goods and trying to conceptualize the just the sheer amount of distance uh, between tribes and then thinking about how those tribes still interacted is just really mind blowing to me. So Candace, how would a student get a career in history like you've had? Um, if you're interested in doing something like archeology, span one of the things that I would recommend is studying or taking courses in anthropology, in museum studies and or in the regional history that you are interested in. I myself, uh, studied at UCLA. I earned my bachelor's degrees in anthropology and in uh, archaeology, and I earned my master's degree in Near Eastern archaeology. Um, how you go about go getting a career in archaeology can vary in many ways. It really depends on which area you're interested in. If you're interested in research and and being outside and getting dirty, I highly recommend studying archaeology and or anthropology. If you're interested in doing curation and the care of artifacts, I would highly recommend a combination of history and museum studies. Well, that's great. Hey, what was, was this your dream as a child? And if not, what was your dream? It was my dream, as a matter of fact. Uh, one of the things that I did to... Uh, before I became an archaeologist was I actually served in the Marine Corps. And when I got out, I went to school. And that's uh, one of the routes you can take to uh, kind of scholarship yourself through, if you will. Um, and that's what I did. Great. And who, was there anybody who influenced you to get this career that you have? When I was in school, one of the main things that, that came up was whether or not I would go the curation route or whether or not I would choose uh, something that's more writing-based or uh, theoretical, for example. Um, and working with Dr. Kara Cooney at UCLA was really what scared, uh, steered me towards museum studies and caring of artifacts. Uh, she actually is an Egyptologist who studies uh, Egyptian coffins and works with a lot of museum collections to decipher the text that is found, not only on the outside of the coffins, but on the actual wrappings and within the texts that are found inside tombs. Wow, that's awesome. Um, what's the most interesting piece of archaeology you've found? Um, hmm, that's a great question. I think one of the most amazing discoveries was actually an accidental discovery that we made in Santa Barbara, which was a, a burial. And it was a gentleman who was buried with a, a fully intact bowl and mono or grindstone in his lap and was buried sitting cross-legged upright facing the setting sun and the ocean, which is obviously a very rare way for to be buried and requires a lot of work and excavation, um, but was really, really uh, incredible and gave you something of a, a, you know, a chill to to think about the love and the care that somebody put in to that person. Yeah. So. Do you have any big projects come up or new discoveries you're looking for? <laughs> uh, well, we are always serving and we are always learning new things. And one of the things that I like to tell people uh, that make them feel really old is that every year we gain new uh, things that you would consider to be artifacts because 
any type of material that is over 50 years can be considered part of the historical record. So for the example, the other day, I recovered a Coca-Cola bottle from the 60s, which, you know, a couple of decades ago was not an artifact, but now is. And so I, I told my father that, for example, and it made him feel very old. <laughs> So kids might even have some things that could be considered artifacts. Absolutely. Um, when you go into an antique store, you may decidedly think that these are just objects. But if you're looking at something that's over a century old, uh, spoon sets, ceramics, porcelain, those are still considered archaeological in nature, especially if they help tell a story about human culture. Well, that's great. 